have heard from several folks that kids are having some problems. And I know that several kids are struggling, but I've heard some very specific situations that have been going on with kids of uh, first responder and LEO families. So I wanted to make a podcast that was for you. So if you have kids or if you know people that have kids and they're struggling a little bit, stay tuned because we're going to talk about that. Welcome to episode 66 of the Code for Couples podcast. Welcome back to the Code for Couples podcast. This is Cindy Doyle, LEO wife and licensed professional counselor. Today, I am going to be talking about what's going on with our kids. Um, I've heard several stories uh, from people over Instagram and just people contacting me and saying, hey, my kids are really struggling. I don't know what to do. They haven't done this before. And so I reached out to somebody I know uh, she's actually in one of my groups that I connect with, and it is Dr. Amy Parks, and she is here to talk to us today because she is an expert with kids, where I am not. So Amy, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I'm so it. excited. Thank you, Cindy. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Let me tell you a little bit about Amy because she has a lot going on. She's pretty awesome. Um, she describes herself as a lifelong educator, a passionate psychologist, and often stressed out, but mostly happy mom of four. So she knows what it's like for sure. Um, she's a clinical director and owner of Wise Family in Northern Virginia. Uh, that does counseling and assessment, mainly focused on children's teams and family. So this is her area of expertise. She is a lot of fun and she has a lot of energy and that's why, you know, I bring her on. Uh, but she describes herself as a brain enthusiast. You know, I've been talking a lot about the brain lately and how this is impacting our brain. And so she's going to be talking about um, how it, this is unique to kids and their brain. So Amy, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, let me kind of tell you some of the things that I've been hearing, um, yeah, absolutely. which is, which is unique. Um, I've had several people reach out to me on like direct messages and emails. Um, and they're telling me that the kids are struggling in a different way that, uh, kids are not sleeping through the night. They seem really restless during the night, wake up during the night, want to, this is something they haven't done before where they're wanting to crawl in bed with parents or parents are having to like calm them down in the middle of the night to get them back to bed. Um, nightmares, a lot of nightmares going on, like almost like night walking at times. Um, also hearing sometimes about kids that their anxiety is high and leaving the house. Um, so as you know, some of our law enforcement officers are needing to stay away from home longer. I know that's probably an aspect of it. Uh, there's been pictures on social media where the officers will come and say hi to their kids through a window. So I know they're experiencing a lot. And I know that as we move through it and people are trying to get back out, out there, it seems like this isn't really changing. It's almost escalating in a way. So can you tell me a little bit about what's going on or probably a lot about what's going on for these kids? Yeah, absolutely. So like asking someone if they're anxious these days is really like asking them if they enjoy music or, <laughs> you know, a sunset. I yes, mean, it's pretty, I get that. It's, it's this like dull hum in the background. So I heard yeah, someone use yeah. the phrase emotional tinnitus. Tinnitus is that. Oh, like tinnitus is what I've yes, always called it. Yeah, okay, the yeah ringing exactly. in the ear. Exactly. Tinnitus okay. is reading is that ringing in the ear. So it's like an emotional tinnitus. It's this constant hum of uncertainty and mm -hmm. sitting and waiting and not knowing what's coming next. And so, I mean, this is really unavoidable. This is just the, sort of the state we're in right now. But your families, families that are first responders, not just police, but also families that have medical professionals, of Absolutely. course, they're going on the front lines every single day, um, are are part of what is part of a normal crisis mode mm -hmm. and also an extra layer of this hypervigilance that's happening for families. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, they're really, what you're describing, the families that you have reported to you, the nightmares and the, the sleepwalking and, and the like unusual tantrums. I hear a lot of parents, their kids are bedwetting or they're, they're not, they were potty trained and now they're not anymore. Like yes. what the heck is that about? So, you know, really there are three psychological phases in, in, in a crisis. Okay. Um, the first one is the emergency. And that's when we have really shared, clear goals, an urgency that makes us feel energized and focused and even really maybe productive. So mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Cindy, but I cleaned out my entire house during the <laughs> beginning of this COVID thing. Like I, and in fact, our trash pickup in Alexandria, Virginia, they said, yeah. stop. Like we're not taking anything extra. You oh my gosh. That are cleaning out all your, right, exactly. I like, I was completely, it's the most productive ever. And that's part of that emergency response. Like go in, do it. Yeah. Right? I um, think for, for us, I think um, a lot of us, as far as the emergency response was kind of supporting our first responder, whoever that was, yeah, and figuring yeah. out how do we rally behind that. that. That's probably how a lot of us responded to that emergency. So I can definitely relate to that. And okay. that whole word rally, you mm -hmm. know, okay, let me make sure that the house is extra calm mm -hmm. and we have Absolutely. all the right nutritious meals. And clean. And, and clean. Do, do I have all the Clorox bleach and, and wipes or do I need to go buy alcohol at the store to make sure that I can wipe it down? Yes. And let right? me drive 75 miles because I hear they have Clorox wipes, right? Yes. Like, so yes. that kind of, that kind of emergency response is that very common first psychological phase. Okay. And, and, and sadly, unfortunately, we're now in only the second, really the part of psychological, the psychological response to crisis. And that's called regression. Okay. And that's really when we mm. realize that the future is kind of uncertain. Mm -hmm. We've lost kind of a sense of purpose. We get tired, irritable, withdrawn, maybe less productive. And some of us are there. Some of us maybe are moving into the third phase, which is the recovery. When we get, mm. begin to sort of, like you and I were just talking about before this started, June 1st is coming <laughs> and yeah. that's going to be like the first day of the year. And we're going to do our kind of, yes. So yeah. or reorienting, revising our goals, our expectations and roles, and sort of beginning to focus on moving beyond and, and really getting, you know, versus getting by. Which is, yeah. So that regression phase is what we're seeing a lot with kids because parents do a whole lot to sort of manage the chaos. Mm -hmm. But when they have moved into regression, it's easy to let it sort of start falling apart at home. Okay. And then kids start to feel that as well. Okay. So it's kind of this unease unraveling is kind of and what that totally feels like. it's normal. Yeah. It's not permanent. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can, it, it's, an, it's important to keep it in check, but it's not permanent. Everyone needs to sort of give themselves some grace and understand that I promise you, I absolutely 100% promise you that your neurotypical child who is bedwetting right now will not be doing that in the 11th grade. Like by the time they are in high school, <laughs> it will be fine. Yes. Okay. So, so not just, permanent. Yeah. So just um, like a generous explanation is comes sometimes what I say, like, Hey, you know what? This is reasonable for what's going on. Yes. Don't panic. Yes. Just, just know that it can happen. I, I'm thinking about these two, like the emergency regression recovery and listening to this phase. And I can definitely understand that for, kids in uh, first responders that this looks very different to some of the kids that are out there that are not in first responder families because I had a I was talking to a friend who was telling me that she um, relented and decided to have a little bit of a play date because they said well everybody's been under quarantine everybody's fine so we will wear our masks and make sure we stay six feet apart, but still have a play date of some right. kind. And she thought that she, oh, I'm getting goosebumps talking about this. She thought that she and the mom were on the same page. She got there and the kids had no masks. There, this other woman's family had no masks and her kids were wearing masks. Her one son was kept elbowing her because he was pissed. He was mad. Like, right. Right. Not because he had to wear a mask and they didn't, but because of what he had been taught right. and told 
that he felt in danger and he was mad at his mom for putting them in danger because they talked about it afterwards. Wow. And, and so like, it's making like, God, oh, it like all the feels with this is because I could feel for this kid and the mom in the sense of like, I was doing the best I can. I thought I was doing the right thing and letting them play. And then now my kid feels angry at me and unsafe because they didn't have masks on and right well and and you know you so I look at these these like these phases and I'm like oh some of them are sounds like it's still it's kind of that like end emergency just going into regression and the conflict between families that don't have this vigilance like we do Right. In a right. different way. So, well, and you know, it's, it's even like, I mean, if you look at different states of our country, you know, that mm. certain states have been locked down super tight mm -hmm. and other states have not been. Mm -hmm. And for various reasons that we could probably debate forever, mm -hmm. um, you know, different states have had and, and chosen to look at things differently. And the same way that states are looking at things differently, you know, families do too. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what's true for first responder families is that the values and norms for first responder families are often different because of the necessity to be differently oriented. And yeah. it doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean a state is bad because it did this or good because it did that. It's not a value judge. It's not a judgment on, right. on their choices. It just is. And I think that's a hard reality for most people when I say something like that, like this isn't a judgment, it just is, you're just being. And so for those families, you know, setting these values and norms for themselves within the family, so interfamily, mm -hmm. and then in the community, like intra with other families, like the family you're talking about, the mom and the other mom and the masks and stuff. Um, the key for, for many families, first responder or not, really is to explain how is our family different? How does our family normalize oh. How do we, um, how, what are the values of our family? And, and I always tell, I, I really like thinking about the word and versus but. Mm. So we use the word but a lot. So for example, I might say, well, we're going to go to our friend's house, but we're going to have to wear masks. Instead, your brain processes that language so specifically. If I were to say, we're going to go to our friend's house and we're going to wear masks. There's so much more of an acceptance of the reality versus I'm giving a restriction. So when I say, but, so if I have a first responder family and I'm talking to my children and I say, we're going to go to grandma's because dad is going to be working full time on the front lines with these very very ill people who really are very delicate and we need to all stay safe so that he can be healthy and we can be healthy. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it's, when we're, when it's time, we're going to come back. So rather than saying, we're going to go to grandma's house so dad can do this thing, but it, you know, it's going to be okay. Or, but dad's going to call us. I mean, it just sort of, it's a, it's a one language shift, one word shift that makes such a huge difference to the brain it just opens up the idea that this is, these two things can exist at the same time in a healthy way. There's not some kind of restricted concept here. Like we're going to grandma's and it's going to be, you know, but it's going to be okay. We're going to go to grandma's and it's going to be okay. That's you such. See what I'm oh, oh yes, totally. Like I, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, like if you mind try it blow. In your own life. Yeah. It's just mind blowing that that one little word, <laughs> because I'm listening to it and I'm like, yes, go ahead. Uh-huh. Exactly. So we can just sh change that word, the word and from, from, from and from, but to and can make such a big difference. I mean, I, when I talk about discipline with children, we talk about the whole dot idea of if versus when. So mm. if you go to bed now, we'll be able, if you, if you get to bed, we'll be able to read a story versus when you get to bed, we'll be able to read a story. Wow. The difference there is I got a choice versus there's an expectation that's been set. So, you know, for first responder families to say something like, you know, if dad gets home on time, we're going to do blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Or if mom comes home or if mom gets off early, blah, 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 versus when mom does this, mm -hmm. then we'll do this. It's just such a clearly defined expectation versus creating the uncertainty of, I have to make a choice. 
And you know what I think of too, when I hear the word like if versus when or but versus and like those little things, you know, I automatically, when I was listening to it, it's kind of like that anticipation of like sitting around waiting for the thing to happen as opposed to like, okay, well it will happen. It's just a matter of, we don't know what time. So like, instead of like, what if this happens or what if this doesn't happen? And you and I both know the what ifing quote unquote, <laughs> right. like what right. ifing leads to anxiety in itself. So when this well, happens and, that, and yeah. this will happen, you know, it, it makes sense because it kind of soothes that system in our brain for sure. Exactly. And what that anxiety that we were talking about, that emotional tinnitus, you know, that constant like feeling that we're having mm-hmm. right now, that's true for first responders all the time, all yes. the time. Yes. So that vigilance, and I want to call it vigilance because it only becomes hypervigilant when it disrupts your functioning. Correct. All right. So let's be clear. It becomes hypervigilant when it's disruptive of your functioning, whatever that means, your relationships, your communication, mm-hmm. your ability to be perform, to perform on the job with reasonable certainty, you know, to make strong decisions that are appropriate for the circumstance, blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> Being able to have, be vigilant, and vigilant means keep careful watch. So if you're, if you're keeping careful watch all the time, you are consistently and constantly in a state of what we call a flash forward. Mm. Um, so you know you've heard of flashbacks when yes. people have had some kind of trauma in their past. Mm-hmm. Well, a flash forward is a hypervigilant sort of predicting the wreckage of the future. Mm. And so <laughs> you'll hear kids like, they'll say something like, if I talk to mom about that, she's going to get really angry. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I just think she will. Well, that's a flash forward. So let's not do that. Let's not live in that place of flashing forward the wreckage of the future. Let's just live right here and figure out how to sort of manage that vigilance because there's a short term goal there and a long term goal. We need to stay healthy. And if we're hypervigilant, then we go into cognitive decline, cardiac decline. Our body's like ready to fight the tiger all the time. It's exhausting. Your cortisol level is like through the roof. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm listening to you and I giggled a little bit because it was like that knowing laugh and living in the situation. I mean, we as law, you know, first responder families, especially with law enforcement, I would say more so than maybe others, but maybe not. Um, I, I think we're flash forwarding a lot because the eggshells are very prevalent. Like, okay, what's the reaction? I, one of the things that I say a lot is that our first responders are trained to react, not to respond. And so mm-hmm. they're used to reacting. And so we become conditioned because they're reacting. Um, you said something really important, what prior to us when we were just chit-chatting before I started recording is you were talking about the modeling which I think goes right leads right into what you're talking now and how it's a little bit different in first responder families than it is in the I don't know normies as I call them sometimes (laughs) but (laughs) when you non-first responder family there you go the people whose parents work for like IBM and <laughs> you know zero. I was actually and... to say IBM, so that's funny. Anyway, um, <laughs> so can you? Yeah, can it's you very talk about different. The modeling. Yeah. So um, you know, the other thing too is to think about this social distancing thing because mm-hmm. I think that really goes hand in hand. So our brains are socially oriented. We oh, yes. learn everything. If we had no language we would still be able to learn the majority of the things that we need to learn to function because think about societies where, you know, people are together or children that are together that don't speak the same language. We learn by watching other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially pre-language, you know, young, young children learn by watching us. Mm -hmm. So that's how they learn to hold a fork and feed themselves. That's often how they learn to go potty. You know, they watch their mom pee in the toilet, you know, like things like that. Those are, those are important. And our brain does that automatically. We have these mirror neurons that allow us to observe behavior and copy it. Yeah. So if, um, and and right now, because we have this social distance thing and we have children at home 
who would normally be learning from their peers and interacting with their peers, it's more critical than ever um, for parents to be very intentional about what they model at home. Okay. So oftentimes, I, I, I'm going to sort of, sort of take a leap based on what I know about the brain and what I know about children and families. But I would think that most of the time, you know, the eight hour day with your peers kind of balances out a couple hours of like home time the, in terms of the modeling. Like I'm yeah, going to see eight hours that. of my peers and I'm going to normalize that. And then I'm going to go home and I'm going to normalize that. So <laughs> there's no one, you know, moment of time that's more influential maybe than the other mm -hmm. per se. But Right now, you've got 24 seven with parents who are, and siblings who are in first responder families who are already incredibly vigilant, who are way overworked, way mm -hmm. overstressed, probably hot as heck because they have to wear so much gear. Blows my mind. <laughs> yesterday I had to wear a mask. I mean, I have to wear a mask all the time, but yesterday it was hot here and I was wearing a mask and I was like, this sucks. I started to feel nauseous because mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm so hot right now. This mm -hmm. is so bad. What am I going to do? And that's just one mask. You know, right, these police right. officers, <clears throat> hospital workers are wearing like six. So, um, so they're happy. They're they're with parents who are really just constantly on edge right now, more than ever before. Yeah. And therefore, having being incredibly intentional about being at home and being calm, having you know, neuro, kids that in families that are not necessarily with first responder parents. They can, they can be a little, families can be a little more lax on the social media rules and the using the computer and the TV and stuff like that. And families that have first responder parents, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not sure, you know, which way we want to go on that, but have to really think more carefully about what kind of relaxation activities are we participating in, in a as a family? How are we turning down the volume? very intentionally okay. on our stress. Like seriously, I know this sounds like the hokiest idea ever, but one of the best things that first responder families can do is start doing like yoga together or meditating together. I know people think that sounds really hokey, but imagine the peace that you could mentor and gain for yourself by just sitting. Maybe you play bird songs on the, on the mm -hmm. iPad mm -hmm. and you just sit together and hold hands. Um, or you share your meal without any, you know, distractions yeah. or you wake up together in the morning and you take a quiet walk. Those things have to happen in okay. first responder families. Okay. They're a really lovely bonus meal for regular families, yeah. but for first responder families, that is essential sustenance. Okay. Okay. So making sure that they are purposefully, I'm going to say like turning down the vibrate. I think of it as like a vibration. Sure. If that yeah. makes sense, because yeah. that's kind of what it feels like for me at least. It's yep. like, a, like my husband comes home and there's a different vibration in the house. And so yeah. I think that's the same thing that, um, you know, I had my own experience definitely through this whole process of my husband being out on duty and what was that going to mean? And, and so my own vibration about that yeah. and turning it down, purposely turning it down and turning it down with my, I don't have any kids, but if I did my kids in that way. Right. And I want to make sure to say also that none of us knew how to go through this. So this nope. isn't like, Oh, somebody's done it wrong. It's the fact that we nope. didn't know and, and so now that we know that this is going to potentially be something, I mean, I think all of us in at least first responder world, I think many other people are saying, oh, there's going to be the second wave or is school going to, I know kids are concerned it's like school going to happen. And so they still have their concerns and fears and worries and future think, and we do too. And so being very purposeful about like, okay, this is something we need to incorporate into our life now. Don't beat mm -hmm. yourself up for what's happened in the past. Just start mm -hmm. from this place forward. And how can you purposely turn down that volume in your family or with your kids or even with yourself um, to- All of the above. You know, yeah. I talk about spillover many times, and this is, this is a different type of spillover that we're going to spill over um, that intentional- 
like volume control and turning that down. I well, like that. I think maybe differently from even, even other circumstances, this is like toxic spillover. Oh, absolutely. So it's really easy for it to turn, it to turn bad. And there is absolutely, you're right. There is no judgment here. This is mm -mm. something we know is just like I was saying before, it just is. And whatever's going to happen in the fall or the winter or the future, again, we can't flash forward and be, and be healthy. We have to just say, okay, when that happens, when the future happens, whatever that looks like, we know that we have these tools. We know that we have this communication skill set. Mm -hmm. We know that we have this safety net of our family, of our friend group, of our community to fall back on. And one of the problems, and I'm not a first in a first responder family, but um, I can imagine that one of the major problems or issues for first responder families is the asking for help. Mm. Because when you are a helper, mm -hmm. it's really pretty hard to ask for help because you mm -hmm. think I got to know it all. And, you know, like I can't really ask for help because I'm supposed to be helping everybody. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine that there are very many, you know, brave police officers who want to be like, I need help. Right. Um, absolutely. But guess what? We need help mm -hmm. and we need help to turn down the volume. Sometimes that knob is tough to turn. Absolutely. And we need some more muscle in there. And if that means you need, you know, a college kid to come home and help you organize the house or make a couple meals or take a walk with your kids, or you need to make a point of having lunch with your spouse who's at work, to mm. get away and be qu have some quiet time. If you asking for help probably is more important now than ever. Yeah. When you think about, like I said, some of the um, harder, I don't want to call it extreme, but more of the concerns that I've been hearing is um, you talked about behavior, but I was talking about like nightmares. Um, mm -hmm. I know one of my, uh, one of the people I was talking about, that when her child is leaving the house now to go to the grocery store with her or something like that is it, to me, it sounds like almost a panic attack, but anxiety is popping up. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with mm -hmm. those kinds of things? Well, you know what, first of all, let me back up. It's like, what's going on in their mm -hmm. brain potentially that is causing them to be restless, have nightmares in the middle of the night. Um, mm -hmm. And is that really also linked maybe to the higher anxiety of leaving the house? do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, you've got two brain states. So, you know, one is awake right. and one is asleep. So, mm -hmm. but our brain works just as hard when we're asleep um, as it does when we're awake. It's just a different type of work. And so um, for the child that's leaving the house and feeling anxious about, you know, being outside and being in the world, that's where that, that's definitely where one of the modeling is a big part of that, you know, for mom to be very calm, to be very clear that no matter what everybody else does, this is how we as a family are going to stay safe. Okay. Um, and so no matter what anybody else does, this is how we're going to stay safe. And, and really being candid about that, you know, really being very clear, helping kids buy into the idea that we as a family, this is how we have read the science and we've listened to the doctors and this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to stay safe. And other families might do different things. You had yeah. also mentioned about um, when we were talking, I was like, is this the part we're bringing them into the plan? Like, okay, guys, yes. we're, we're going to leave the house now and bringing yes. them into the plan of leaving the house. Is that because when I'm, I'm thinking of this specific person and my gosh, she is the model of calm. I tell her all the time. Okay. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. you are the, you are the most patient mom ever. Um, so I'm wondering if, the bringing into the plan aspect may be something because you had mentioned that yeah. maybe before we started so, talking. Yeah, exactly. And, and so bringing kids into, this is the plan of how we're going to do things and talking about it as a family. How does that make you feel? How do you feel when other people aren't wearing masks? How do you mm. feel when we get in the car? What are your concerns about that? Being really transparent. And you know what? It might take several conversations. Like you're probably thinking the parents out there are thinking there's no way my kids are going to sit at the table for like 20 minutes and have this long conversation <laughs> about all these things. Write down your questions, write down what you think your family might need to talk about and split them up into small manageable little opportunities. Um, but 
anxiety is eased by being able to articulate our feelings. When you can name it, you can tame it, right? Yeah. So being able to talk about like, it feel, makes me feel sad that other people maybe aren't protecting themselves as well. Or it makes me feel sad that other people aren't thinking that they need to do this and, and we have to. It makes me feel hot that I have to wear a stupid mask and nobody else is wearing one. Like yes. that, and that makes me angry. So really being very clear and candid about that. But also we have to teach kids, and this is for the broader, like our broader lives. We have to teach kids that being uncomfortable isn't a bad thing. Learning yes. to live with a little bit of discomfort distress tolerance is a good thing. We make lives, we make, our lives are so easy now in comparison to what, you know, a hundred sure. years ago, maybe Absolutely. even 50 years ago, but our lives are so much, we're so, we have so much of an easier life. I mean, in many ways it's harder, but in terms of like survival, our lives are much easier and mm -hmm. just a little bit of discomfort for kids. And we're there quickly to fix it especially mm -hmm. helper families, right? Like, let mm -hmm. me solve this problem and move on. Mm -hmm. That's what you're mm -hmm. trained to do as a first responder. Let me fix this and keep on going. And so helping kids understand that it's okay to feel discomfort. It's oh, anxiety is a normal feeling. Worry is a normal thing to be feeling. Yeah. It's always funny when I hear little kids saying, I have anxiety, I think, I know you didn't learn that word on your own. Someone told you that. <laughs> I think the same thing too, so I understand, yeah. Usually I hear something like, I'm worried or my stomach aches. Those mm -hmm. are like the two, so that's what you hear from kids. And so, um, so, yeah, so that parent is probably doing an amazing job of modeling ease and anxiety, and that's like more than half the battle. Mm -hmm. So now it's more about, let's talk, and, and instead of flashing forward, uh, uh, an unknown scenario, let's talk about what we might encounter. So we're going to go in the car and, you know, this is how we do exposure therapy, right? So we're going to go in the car and this is, and we're going to drive to the store and in the car, we don't need to wear our masks and we can listen to music and sing as loud as we want. We're going to drink a little water because we won't be able to drink any water when we're at the grocery store. Like walking through the experience um, is, can be really helpful. I, I love that. And, and I can even go forward and say, and we're going to see some people that aren't wearing masks and what's right, that going right. to be like, and what are we going to do to keep ourselves safe? Because I can see that being a conflict because even living with, with my situation there, my, my husband wouldn't let me leave the house for four weeks. And I finally said, I, you're just going to have to get uncomfortable because for a long right. time, for the first part of this, I said, okay, I need to make him feel comfortable so he right. doesn't have to worry about home. Right. And, and now I think we're at a point where it's like, okay, you know what? Some of this is that maybe part of this is that we are going to have to make our first responder feel a little uncomfortable too, because the bigger good is like, maybe it's taking too much of a toll. On the yeah, there has to be a little bit of faith through. and trust there, There's you know, and, and I think there, there may be something to, and I haven't really thought this through much, but there may be something true to, to the language of safe versus healthy, um, because Ooh. safety does have a connotation of like, I might be like mortally injured or I might be scared really, really like, I really have a really big scare no. situation versus like, I might kids don't really understand what unhealthy looks like. It just means like a runny nose or a cough to them. So I, I, I don't know. I have to play with that a little bit more, but, but we Amy, might think about that language. Amy, I think you're exactly right because what we use, the language we use is that we have to be safe. That's the word well, that right. I know that we, like I got goosebumps now, so I know you're uh -huh. all right. So it, it's to <laughs> I love me. Your, I love your physical response to like, <laughs> to like good, good, good words. <laughs> so, so I think you're right. Just like you were saying about using and instead of, uh -huh. instead but. of, but, and then when instead of if, I think it is a healthy versus safe. Because right. that is a word that we use all the time is that we have to stay safe. And, and, and there's a fear, important. super and, fear associated with mm, safe. Mm, yeah. yeah. That, that, and then fear always is, yeah. So, so everybody, I hope you heard that, that maybe just changing some of those words around that, hey, we have to say, stay healthy. We are, and switching that, moving that around in, instead of safe. So and, and in terms of like thinking about that reorientation idea, I just want to touch on the nightmare part real quick. So that's where I wanted you know, to go to. So perfect. yeah. So, you know, our brains are doing different work at night. And so yes. it's really funny 
you know how sometimes if you think if you've ever asked someone said, oh, I had a nightmare, you're like, oh, tell me about it. Like, that sounds scary. Tell me more about it. When someone tells me I have a night, they had a nightmare, I'm like, that's amazing. That's great. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, oh, your brain is doing amazing work trying to solve a problem. What's the problem you think your brain was trying to think about? Because that's exactly what your brain is doing at night. Your wow. brain is the most powerful problem solving machine in the world. If you don't give it the time to do it during the day, it's going to solve problems at night. Now, I'm not saying it does a good job all the time of solving a problem. Like it doesn't necessarily, you know, solve it in a way that, that makes, makes some sense. sense or something that could be realistic in the daytime type of thing or in real life. But it does do, it does bring in creative ways of resolving conflict and anxiety and stressors. So when I reframe that for kids, I'm like, that's great. Like I'm like super. And they think, well, this is supposed to be a bad thing. I'm like, no, it's a wonderful thing. It means your brain is trying to solve something. And so we play like brain detective and try to figure out what is happening right now at night in your brain. And then what happens is sometimes, not all the time, kids look forward to going to sleep because they think, okay, good. I'm going to fix, I'm going to solve this problem in the night. And then they'll wake up the next day and guess what my brain said about blah, blah, blah. I know. Oh my and gosh. it's like goal. Yeah. It's great. So I'm not saying that works magic all the time, but it, it can be a whole big shift because we buy into that dreams are supposed to be, that nightmares are scary mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. they are something that we should protect, be precious about. Oh, mm -hmm. that's so scary. And just that response of, oh, that's just like a, have you ever seen someone like a little kid falls down? Like I was with my grandson over the weekend and he fell down, like pretty big fall down. Mm -hmm. And he fell down and he, and I was like, oh, yay, Jordan, you fell down. Like, it's okay. And then he was like, looking at me like, are you crazy lady? Like, what are you talking about? I just fell down. He's only two. I just, it, it, but I'm, you could see it in his face. It's like, I just fell down. I'm going to bleed. This is horrible. I feel terrible. Oh, but you think it's okay. So, okay, I'll get up. I'll be fine. It was that whole, it's that whole same kind of way. Okay. Of like dreams don't have to be terrifying. Okay. You can allow them to help be instructive. I think that is incredibly helpful because I think that, you know, we, we have our own fears when kids wake up and they're experiencing that. And I think it's very human. And I think you would agree. It's human for us not to have what people to experience pain. Right. right. And so right. it's natural for us to be like, Oh my gosh, you're, you're scared. Come right. let me comfort you. I think that's a very natural response, but wow, to spin that around and say, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Right. What do you think your brain was working on? Right. Like, and you can crap. still comfort them. I mean, it's not like you're like blowing it off. Right. Um, but, but exploring all of the nuances of a dream can be a fascinating way of trying to figure out how your child is thinking through a problem. Oftentimes, for example, right now we've seen like young children have lots of attacks from monsters and people and like scary things behind yes. trees yes. because of the unknown, like something yes. I've never seen a monster before. So this is what it looks like to me mm -hmm. or a bear maybe, or something like that. And so, you know, that like, that's the unknown thing. I'm trying to attack it. And then some kids will have like an arsenal of tools to attack the bear, you know, monster. Mm. And then other kids are like, I just ran away. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, or I just stood there and we looked at each other. I mean, it's just interesting sort of the different ways um, it, that manifests in the brain. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, this has been, man, so helpful. I love the language aspect. I love the, the insight on the dreams. You know, we were talking about that everybody's kind of transitioning at this point and that there are some aspects that we don't know and, um, that we are kind of unsure of what's going to happen. Are there, are there things that families can do to, I mean, we've talked about kind of the purposeful dialing it down. Are there other, other aspects um, that families need to consider as they continue to go through this, as we continue to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. um, and shifting those roles because parents are taking on so many roles right now and we don't know if that's going to change. Well, I definitely think everyone should be giving themselves some grace. You know, okay. if your kid didn't finish their fifth grade year homework, yeah, um, it's not the end of the world. You know, if 
if you didn't make dinner all week, again, it's not the end of the world. Like there, there are, there needs, we need to give ourselves a break Mm -hmm. right now because of, I mean, think again, back to that psychological response to emergency and, you know, emergency regression recovery. Yeah. It's, it's, if you think about a psychological response in the way that we would think about a physical response. So, you know, someone has surgery and they spend the first, you know, week Mm -hmm. in this state of, Hey, can you help me get up? Have you can, you know, I need pain medication, blah, blah, blah. Then they go into like rehab Mm -hmm. and then they go into like careful, you know, re-entry. I mean, Mm -hmm. that it's the same. The psychological response is the same as that physical response. Exactly the same. So we're in that like rehab sort of time, but could we go back to an emergency response? Maybe. And we don't know. And so for families to be able to talk and say, we just don't know what's going to happen, but here's what we do know. What we do know is that we have all the toilet paper that we could ever need. <laughs> and we have all the hand sanitizer and we know who our, who our helpers are yeah. and we know we're healthy and we know the ways that we can protect ourselves and be, and be healthy and safe. These are all the things we know. And we know that we are there for each other. Um, you know, whether the family's together or separate or whatever, being really clear about what we do know. And then again, going back to that, you know, some things might feel a little uncomfortable, but we're mm-hmm. here together. You've, hear, you've heard people say like, we're in this together. And to some extent, it's almost a little cliche now, but if you really think about what that means, mm-hmm. it's pretty profound. Mm-hmm. If you think about an enti- our entire world is experiencing the same thing. That has never happened in our lifetimes, Mm -mm. ever, ever. So that is amazingly profound. And so for a family to say, we're in this together is, is an, is an incredible opportunity to build, you know, that kind of, that kind of net of emotional security. That's perfect. Amy, thank you so much. You've brought in, I love the language aspect. I love that in the middle of this, you were like, you know what, maybe it's, healthy versus safe. Maybe <laughs> not. I mean, just thinking on the fly like that is so helpful. I also like the fact of like talking about the values of our family. And these are, these are, this is how our family system operates. And it's okay if other family systems operate differently. And this right. is what, in talking about that, um, modeling some of the behavior that we can do as an adult to turn down our, our own, like really make, make it quiet, being very intentional within our own family systems, because we know that we have that extra layer that is a part of our system as well. And being in the moment, talking about the feeling, bringing the kids in to talk about the plan, um, not flashing forward is something that you brought up. And You're then- such a great listener, Cindy. Wow, <laughs> man. <laughs> and, and just having grace, giving, yeah. giving yeah. grace and also I, I think part of that is not us flashing forward and worrying sure. about like, oh God, is my, is my, you know, kid that was potty trained and having nightmares now going, going to be an 18 year old that's going to have this problem and right. what traumatic effect are we going to have that we can, right. we can impact that by just talking and talking about the feelings and normalizing the feelings. And I know it, it if, you need a feelings chart. There's plenty of them online. Sure. I know for kids, well, you know, feelings are a thing like feelings, yeah. ugh, right? But there are- well, you ask a kid like, how do you feel? And they say, okay, that's not a feeling yeah, word. No. Give them some language. I mean, language is, as you said, super, super powerful. So using that, yeah. I also, you know, one of the things that I've done too is use the emojis on your phone. Sure. Find the emoji that goes with you, the way you're feeling right now. Yeah. And let's actually, about- that's very instructive sometimes. Cause I don't know what half those emojis actually <laughs> like are supposed to be saying. Yes. So it's very instructive to hear from like a 14 year old. Oh, that means surprised. I'm like, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, all right then. But surprised, happy, not surprised sad. Okay. Got it. <laughs> but that's perfect. Like just being able to talk about it. Yeah. So, um, you have a plethora of information. If anybody wanted to get in contact with you, if they're in Virginia specifically and wanted to, you know, get a kid into therapy or connect with you, I also know that you do some speaking as well, talking about kids. So if anybody wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you, Amy? 
Yeah, so there, we try to make it pretty easy. There are a couple easy ways to connect with us. So if you are in Virginia and you want to connect with a therapist, um, either for yourself, your family, or, your, or, or for your kids, you can text us. You text the word WISE HELP, W I S E H E L P, to 66866. 66866. Okay. Wise exactly. Help to and you six, will six, get. Wow. Okay. And as if you text Wise Help to 66866, you will get access to a form that connects with us almost immediately, and someone will call you back in 24 hours. Holy cow. So okay. We'll get you on the schedule right away. If you want to have a little bit more of a conversation because you, you know, you, you want to process something or you need to pick my brain about something, you can go on our website, which is thewisefamily.com. Okay. And in a variety of places, there are buttons that say, let's chat. And that takes you right into my calendar. And I'm happy to give 15 minutes to anybody that wants to have a chat about anything, whether they live in Virginia or, you know, Timbuktu or wherever it is, Texas, of course, wherever. Um, because sometimes you just need to sort of process something with somebody and I am available for that. So I'm always happy to, to offer that to help. People. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, you can understand why I brought Amy on now. She has such great information around kids and she understands them in a deeper level that I know that I would not do justice. And so it's, you know, I ask for help too and bring in an Good expert. For you. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully, guys, this was helpful. Be able to get in touch with Amy if you need to um, and keep your family health, healthy, keep your family healthy um, going forward. So until next time, guys, keep it code four.